We'll do the seven line supplication three times. Supplication to the Takpo Kagyu, uh, the short mandala offering, and the request for teachings. West of the land of Rudiana, on a blooming lotus flower, you have attained supreme wondrous city. You are renowned as Padmakara, surrounded by your retinue of many dakinis. We practice following your example. Please approach and grant your blessing. Guru Padma City Om. Om in the northwest of the land of Rudiana, on a blooming lotus flower, you have attained supreme wondrous city. You are renowned as Padmakara, surrounded by your retinue of many dakinis. We practice following your example. Please approach and grant your blessing. Guru Padma Siddhi Hum. Hum in the northwest of the land of Udiyana, on a blooming lotus flower. You have attained supreme wondrous city. You are renowned as Padmakara. Surrounded by your retinue of many dakinis, we practice following your example. Please approach and grant your blessing. Guru Padma Siddhi Hum. Great Vajra Dara Telo Narumarpa Mila, Lord of Dharma Gampopa, knower of the three times omniscient Karmapa, holders of the four great and eight lesser lineages, Drikung Tak, Sapa, these three glorious Drukpa, and so on, masters of the profound path of Mahamudra, incomparable protectors of beings, the Takpo Kagyu, I supplicate you, the Kagyu Gurus. Hold your lineage, grant your blessings, so that I will follow your example. Revulsion is the foot of meditation, as is taught to this meditator who is not attached to food and wealth, who cuts the ties to this life. Grant your blessings, so that I have no desire for honor and gain. Devotion is the head of meditation, as is taught. The guru opens the gate to the treasury of oral instructions. To this meditator who continually supplicates him, grant your blessing so that genuine devotion is born in me. Awareness is the body of meditation as is taught. Whatever arises is fresh, the essence of realization. To this meditator who rests simply without altering it, grant your blessing so that my meditation is free from conception. The essence of thoughts is dharmakaya as is taught. Nothing, whatever, but everything arises from it. To this meditator who arises in unceasing play, grant your blessings so that I realize the inseparability of samsara and nirvana. Through all my births, may I not be separated from the perfect guru, and so enjoy the splendor of dharma, perfecting the virtues of the paths and bhumis. May I speedily attain the state of vajradhara. The earth is perfumed with scented water and strewn with flowers, and they adorn with Mount Meru, the four continents, the sun and moon. Imagining this is the Buddha realm, I offer it so that all beings may enjoy this pure realm. In accordance with the capabilities and diverse aspirations of sentient beings, I ask that you to turn the wheel of Dharma of the greater, lesser, or conventional vehicles. Good morning, Rinpoche. <clears throat> Thank you for coming back. I hope you had a good night's rest. <laughs> and welcome back, everyone that was here uh, yesterday evening, last night. And uh, welcome uh, those that uh, are joining um, for the first time today in meeting Rinpoche and his teachings. Uh, It's my pleasure to introduce yet again Dotuku Rinpoche. Uh, Rinpoche was born in South India to Tibetan family. 
At the age of 17, he was recognized as the sixth Rakhtal Rinpoche, after which Rinpoche studied Buddhist philosophy and practice in Zongsar Kensei Choki Lodro Institute and graduated as Acharya, or Bopan. For the past 12 years, Rinpoche has been teaching and leading practices in Asia, Europe, and other parts of the world. The teachers he considers his main gurus are His Holiness the Dalai Lama, His Holiness Sakya Trichin, Sakya Dachin Rinpoche, Ludin Kenshin Rinpoche, Kenshin Kunga Wanchuk, Angsar Kensei, Jamyang Kensei Rinpoche, and Jigme Ken Kensei Rinpoche. He currently lives in Germany where he has established his center Arya Teresnet. Besides that, he works as a traditional expert scholar for the Kensei Vision Project. Thank you, Rinpoche, and please teach us. Let's go. <clears throat> now starts my part of the prayers. <laughs> So when you don't have a lot to say, I fill it up with prayers. <laughs> I like it that way. <clears throat> I know that you are familiar with this, but just to um, repeat it. Uh, before teaching, then Dharma teachers are supposed to invite um, for auspiciousness, but also not mere auspiciousness, but also with the trust in Dharma, that since what we discuss here is Dharma, that those who uh, value Dharma, those who are not necessarily visible to us, those who have made promise to Siddhartha Gautama, Shakyamuni Buddha, or Guru Rinpoche, or our lineage gurus, to protect the Dharma, to uphold, to come every time uh, anything related to Dharma is taking place. So, as a, a Dharma sort of teacher, I guess, this is your responsibility then to remind them to appear. So first then, every time I have to recite that, and then making prostrations to Siddhartha Gautama, to remind myself that this is not something uh, <coughs> made up, that is coming from wisdom, and passed from a wisdom mind, to the next. And also then I make prostrations to great bodhisattvas like Manjushri, Avalokiteshvara and Vajrapani to whom Siddhartha Gautama had entrusted his dharma. He had trusted these individuals in particular to uh, make sure that his dharma, and most importantly, the Mahayana teaching, does not wane. <clears throat> and in Mahayana, Vajrayana is also included, of course. Then I um, make supplications to my root gurus, and I take their names and beg for a blessing. And at the end, I make supplications to Mahaguru, Patmasambhava, um, without whom none of this would be possible. Everything of value that you have uh, acquired, gained from um, Himalayan Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism, it's all due to people like Patmasambhava who have made it possible. Kaji, Zirjor, and Jerabla, and Menda, and other genuine down, thinking the wood, Jim and Bosses, the soul, and the Berlin, and Kain down, Kanjir, and the Pulsar, and Jerab the Gavari, but Zimba Kain, but the Dadam Jetarba, and Begur, to be soon in Jinidrish, rather than in Mimji, Wombo down, Jajin, Las Chuji, Shalacha, Jabanam, Sangis, or Rabbis, individual, the Dash, 
se ci sono persone che si trovano in un posto dove 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 si trovano Go Shaji Jabisha la Chaksalo Chaktong Kolo Jube Jabotong Chentong Kabasambo Sangeton Kanla Kangdutella Terdem Batsumba Chinrezilla Chasalo Seji Jawa Tamji Ishi Pumbuchik the Basishi Kunji Pajur Jambayan La Chasalo Kanji Ton Shinji Ponyala Down Tani Chojir Jerjeva Dojan La Chasalo Korwa Ledal Tarima Tutare Jijir Turena Namud Domayam La Chasal Nalinda took them sick into some shinkala, she shanty deva, she chavel, la matella, chasa lo, she jatam jizubeja, but do in jelly jube to jizzi some intelligence of the tongue, jangula mesh of la go chant. So a depth of lama can say, Wa Jesus, some shiklama can say, Shinji, no shiklama can say, Wa, then go, can say, Soldier, sick down lama can say, Wa. To Jesus, she la machinseva, Cheno, Cheno la machinse de Cheno, Cheno, Terzin Dani Lama Jamba de Cheno, Chugutalon, Ingi Colon, Lansom Kangi, Chardan, so Nissan Tachi, Tambemba, Tegun Gumbe, Sujuji, Jesse to Nantras of the Jachetal, Nirzol, Yapchini, the Nashantala, Reva Machikan Henta, Ninsen, Kundu Jamin Kube, some de Chiji, Tuji Shu, Junsen Menya Menjas Runga Rangi Nibel, let this say. Tadun, Kenya Major Pardo, Japshin, Solvar Major Ruchin, Ojinu Jen of Jans and Pema Gazar Dombola, Yanzin Shogi, Mudum, Pema Janesis, Cordo, Kandre Mangberg, or Siji Jesu, Tadukji, Shinji, Lobster, Shakes, Sol, Guru, Pema City, Hong, Kusum Lama, Suji Doji, Talacho, Nomun Jungo Drop, Talto, Song, Jet Mojela Zoa, then Gajim Bajim Majun, Shik Tunchen, Samba Droba, then Shodan to Mongo Drop, Talto. Oh, last song. Um, <coughs> I would like to welcome you to um, this weekend program where we are going to discuss bodhicitta and Buddha nature. <laughs> bodhicitta and Buddha nature in one and a half days. Um, well, as this is a Dharma gathering, we need to have um, appropriate motivation. In many ways, Dharma is motivation. It's all based on motivation, whether something is Dharma or not intention, motivation. When Siddhartha Gautama was teaching about cause and effect, he was not really interested about the cause and effect of flowers and trees and rocks and mountains. That was not his intention, although he spoke of those first, because it was important to, uh, even to point to something that was obvious. You, he couldn't just suddenly come and speak of the ultimate reality, then people would not uh, know how to understand it. They would ha not have a, uh, the teacher, Siddhartha Gautama, and listeners, as being, would not have a common ground, something that both can agree upon. And so he said things like, all compounded things are impermanent. or something like ye dharma hetu prabhava you know that mantra meaning chonam tamji chinne chung 
All phenomena comes from causes and conditions. All phenomena comes from causes and conditions. What kind of causes and conditions? Their own separate, unique causes and conditions. No one cause can cause all things. Uh, in that regard, all phenomena, not only they come from causes and conditions, but they are either a cause or a condition of other things, other phenomena. Matter of fact, that is the only thing um, an entity can, can be, can do, to be a result and to be a cause. There's nothing else. Nothing, we do not do anything else. We are caused and we cause things. That's all there is. Of course, Siddhartha was not in, like I said, not really interested about the external world and explain, give a, try to make sense of it. In uh, Pramana Vartika, Pramana Vartika, it means a commentary to valid cognition. Valid cognition, that's important, isn't it? What is the valid cognition? What is the sound mind? What is, it, what is the sane mind? So important. More so now these days. Sometimes I feel everyone will be if you if you go look for it, you'll you'll find some sort of mental disorder, all of us, you know. So, and some. So, sane mind. What is a sane mind? A mind that is you can trust. That's important. Like as we were discussing yesterday, we depend on mind, hundred percent. We depend on our feelings. We depend on our emotions and ex expressions and experiences. So then it's a good question to ask, what is a valid cognition, unmistaken mind? So anyway, he wrote this text, Dharmakirti. He started this text with the question, can we trust the Buddha? Sangi, Kivutsemai, is Buddha a trustworthy being? or not. And so the whole text that follows is an attempt to explore that. Is Buddha a trustworthy being? In that there is one argument where um, argument about omniscience, where he says we do not really care whether Buddha knows what's happening behind the mountain or not. That's really none of our concern whether Buddha can tell what kind of undergarment you're wearing. He says, if you, want to, if you want to follow someone who can see far, maybe follow an eagle, he says, or a vulture, they seem to see far. We are not concerned with that. But the only thing we are concerned with is, does this teacher know the path of liberation or not? When it comes to the path of liberation, is this teacher an omniscient? Does this teacher know everything there is to know about mind and liberation? And so going back to the motivation, Siddhartha Gautama said, all phenomena, all phenomena follows causes and conditions. But amongst all causes of causes and conditions, intention or motivation is supreme, he said. That makes something good or bad. Uh, that makes uh, all of our effort, is it a spiritual practice or not, all based on intention, motivation. In this gathering too. 
now we have decided to spend an hour, two hours a day, two days um, talking about bodhicitta. Bodhicitta, the element, the thing that has um, awakened countless of beings before us and is continuing to awaken countless of beings right now and will do so in future. That is bodhicitta. Um, so, obviously, a certain kind of decorum, uh, motivation, conduct is needed. So, then, if you can have the motivation for the sake of the liberation of all sentient beings, I wish to attain full awakening. And for that purpose, and only that purpose, uh, I will engage in this Dharma discourse, whether speaking or listening or contemplating, whatever. Then, even if then for the rest of the day we just talk nonsense, all, all of that will have been uh, painted with the bodhicitta, influenced by bodhicitta, even uh, breathing, something that is so ordinary. That's what we think, breathing. <laughs> Becomes meritorious. Um, <clears throat> and as I was, yes, so with that kind of motivation, then uh, as yesterday, as I was requesting you to try and sit straight and bring Dharma Raja Siddhartha Gautama to your mind, Gautam. Buddha, our supreme teacher, uh, one who opened the door of liberation to all beings, door of liberation to all beings. We do not say this to try and make him sound very unique, and even, even though he was not unique, not like that. We do not say this to try and sound uh, uh, as if uh, we are looking down on other traditions, other Indian traditions that came before Siddhartha Gautama or during his time. Not at all. It's uh, what he taught was so unique. His concerns were unique. Most teachers at that time uh, from whom he also learned uh, uh, he, he quickly found that uh, their concerns were different. He was looking for an answer, answer to uh, so many questions that most of us do not even know how to ask. We do not even know how to ask these questions. We do not even ask these questions. Simple things that we should all be thinking about, actually, religious or not, Buddhist or not, like this idea of self. Where does this come from? Why must we have it? And why must all of us have it? <laughs> Isn't it incredible? All of us, without exception, has an idea of self, and that, that, that must, that must raise some doubt, that must raise some questions. What is going on? Maybe a bunch of people have it, then you know, it's just them. But all of us, without exception, it is something that is not taught to us. No one has to teach you, you exist. You are a person, you are a being. No one has to be taught. We just have it. These things, 
that we take for granted because of our um, ignorance. Uh, it, uh, it bothered him. It bothered Siddhartha. Why must it be so? Why must So, uh, right when he was about to enter into uh, nirvana, becoming awakened now, that evening he sat under the tree, Bodhi tree, on a seat made of kusha grass, it's a kind of grass that grows in India. <laughs> And around the midnight, he, it is said that he spoke to himself or his own mind or his ego, self-grasping. That he could see it clearly now, the culprit. So he said, from, for a long time I have been looking for you, searching for you. You are the builder. Wherever I am born, you have built a world for me. You have built me until now. So to the, tonight I'm going to burn away all of your timbers, all of your materials. Oh builder, what are you going to do now? And so he entered into his final sort of um, samadhi. And a right when the uh, light of dawn spread through the forest of Gaia, he became fully awakened. So visualization is that, that I request of you. Siddhartha Gautama in front of you, seated under the Bodhi tree, right hand touching the ground, in his left hand in meditation posture, and his gaze fixed on you. And you just watch that. You watch the tree, the Buddha, <clears throat> the dawn, your mind, whatever you do in this visualization is all meditation, is all each moment you accumulate immense merit, each moment countless of lives of negative karma is purified according to Siddhartha himself. So, please. <clears throat> Thank you. Thinking about Buddha is important. Then the meaning of bodhicitta or bodhisattva becomes apparent. It becomes real, not just an idealistic approach or um, 
romantic idea, I guess. Bodhisattva, Bodhicitta can become very romantic. Like, oh, you become the savior and you know, you begin to weave all kinds of stories. Bodhisattva's Bodhicitta is out of sheer necessity, nothing else. It's not an ornament, it's not a thing to do on a weekend. It's, <laughs> it's sheer necessity. Because because we watch, uh, we read the accounts of the Buddha, you can read the accounts of anybody. You might come to a conclusion that although there are many, many great beings, there have been many, many great beings, none seem to have a kind of influence that Siddhartha had. To be able to bring an irreversible change in someone's mind, now that. And without a, without a difficult procedure even, just meditate, just, especially when Buddha would appear. Many times people didn't, he won't even speak a word. There is a sutra where um, one day Buddha is teaching and he tells the monks and nuns and all the lay practitioners there saying different ways an awakened being teach sometimes through sound, sometimes through smell, scent, a scent. There, is a, there are realms, realms where Buddha would send different people to sit under different trees and the trees have a particular scent when, in, when invoke they begin to per emit that scent and then you have to let them in and that purifies your mind <laughs> there are realms where buddha teaches through taste taste and you should eat this you should eat that like that taste it and through taste the mind of beings are transformed Siddhartha himself, one day he said to all the beings there, look at me, look at my heart, he said, look at here. So they all tried to sort of, one by one they came, I think in the beginning was the, um, the lay practitioners, men and women, they came and looked at his, look at his heart. While they're looking at here, well, this is what we call heart. <laughs> here, with devotion, they look at his heart. And while looking at his heart, their mind begins to change. They begin to experience profound meditation that they have never even heard of. And like that, and one by one, monks, nuns, and that, he said, is how a awakened being teaches through colors and image, form. I think it's really true. It's really true. Look at this world. People love Buddha's statue. They love it. They love to have his statue in their gardens and restaurants and toilets. Everywhere is Buddha. Sometimes just the head, sometimes like, but something. It really, this image of Gautama sitting like this, it really is out of his profound wisdom and our merit. And these two meet, that appearance have happened. Nevertheless, 
This is how an awakened being used to uh, liberate beings, help beings. Siddhartha would say a few words. He would say, right at the moment. Sometimes, there was a young man who had the who, was, who had the merit to be an arahat in this life. He was, he was getting married. It was a marriage ceremony happening. Now, according to the, you have seen, even to this day in the Hindu tradition, you, you know, hold the hand and go around and so on. So he was about to <clears throat> hold the hand of his bride. Buddha appeared <laughs> suddenly. <laughs> And he said, Oh Brahmin, Dana Chintang Dana told, if you connect, you will be bound. If you let go, you'll be free. Buddha had obviously nothing against him getting married, but just that this particular boy had the merit, the karma to be awakened in this very life. And it had to happen through him becoming a monk. So the moment the boy heard that, he gained the path of seeing. How many times have we tried to convince someone of something? <laughs> have you tried? I have. I give up now. These days when someone says something strange, I just, I just, let it be. It, it's not, it doesn't work. I have tried so hard because it doesn't work. And for the simple fact that I do not have the wisdom, I do not know what to say, when to say, to whom and how. Even the tone, I do not know. So I, I go in with like a righteous, <laughs> you know, social, what is it, justice warriors. It, it doesn't work. It makes them more angry. Anyway, these days, a sound discussion doesn't exist, I think. Like a real debate, real discussion. <clears throat> For me, someone like me, who is trying every, wherever I go, first of all, I myself am not awakened, no wisdom, full of afflictions. But during the like here, kind of this kind of place, you sit and you remind yourself, none of that here. Here I have to be, <laughs> I should try my best to, to bring the you know, teachings of the lineage and all that. But even that, it doesn't really work. Sometimes people come after the talk, oh, that was so nice, it helped me. I don't know. You know <laughs> maybe today it helps. Now imagine if we are all sitting in front of a Gautama. Gautama. Oh, before the lunch, before dinner tonight, some of us will be awakened. The more you contemplate on the, uh, the benefit of a big, being a fully awakened uh, individual, because I assume, because you are here and topic is bodhicitta, you all have the wish to bring benefit directly, indirectly, one way or another. You really, really want to help, to bring something good. Now, this is what John Sekhinsir says. I really like that. He says, but most of us are like, we, we have love, of course, for others, compassion, but it's very sticky compassion. It's not, it's mixed with our emotions, it's mixed with a, a reply from you, a thank you, a recognition, something. So it's very sticky. So he said, it's like uh, having your hand immersed with the honey. Your hands completely covered with the honey. 
and you try to co- clean someone else's face. <laughs> it's honey. It's sweet. You are sweet. How sweet! You want to benefit. That's sweet, but <laughs> it stinks. And you might even end up. You might actually end up helping a little bit because it sticks. But then, at the end of the day, you cannot really clean anyone else. But it tastes nice. That's our sort of compassion. Um, <clears throat> Mm. So today and tomorrow, I will speak again and again about Siddhartha Gautama. Not to to not um, use this again for to look down on yourself. As I was saying yesterday, not everything has to be on your level right now then there is no progress. Why would you even practice Dharma if everything has to be filtered through your how does that relate to me? What do I do with that? Something there should be something that you desire, that you aspire for. And this for Bodhisattvas is this ultimate benefit to being, in other term, awakening, fully awake, full awakening. Now that, full awakening. We're also going to talk about Buddha nature. Well, depending upon um, what I managed to, to, to discuss, but Buddha nature, Buddha nature. So again, the more we speak of Siddhartha Gautama, his qualities, his ability to be there for being completely without any reservation. Remember yesterday we were talking about how one of the qualities of the Buddha is no fear, no fear. Buddha has no fear, not because he's necessarily because omniscient and all that, but no fear. In the sutras, again, if I repeat, Buddha has no fear. There are many reasons, and one of the main reasons is he has nothing to hide. Buddha has nothing to hide. Then in the context of Buddha nature is to understand that all that qualities would be possible right now if only the obscurations won't be there, afflictions his uh, self-grasping, if only these won't be there, all the qualities of the Buddha, it's not newly acquired, it's just uncovered. That's the teaching of Buddha nature. It's not that, um, as uh, I was saying yesterday, Nagarjuna said, in short, liberation is mere exhaustion of delusions, mere exhaustion of mistake end of mistake. That's all liberation is. Liberation is not a, uh, this thing that we call wisdom. It's not a, something that is uh, acquired newly, but it's always there in, it, in a sense that you can understand it as its potential is always there. Some tradition argue that wisdom itself is not there, but the potential is always there. Or some are more brave and say, no, the very wisdom, awakened wisdom is already here. It's just, it's, 
um, it is obscured, it is hidden, like a sun behind a cloudy sky. Teaching of Buddha nature then says that the wisdom of awakening is present everywhere, not only in beings, but in all things, all things, all things. <laughs> because, remember, and we will discuss this this time too, as Buddha said, the three worlds, the three worlds is mind only, all phenomena, uh, perceptions of mind, creation of mind, or appearance in front of the mind. And so mind is the creator, mind is the doer, and mind itself is through and through immersed in Buddha nature. And so, all things are uh, even as a romantic idea, what an idea to think a rock, <laughs> a boring piece of rock contains wisdom. Not That doesn't mean that it is conscious, it's just that it is creation of mind. <clears throat> it is influenced by wisdom. Most importantly now, for people like us who really want to do something good, who wants to benefit, bring benefit, <clears throat> then this becomes another source of compassion, a very, very strong, compelling reason for compassion when you look at others, uh, someone who is suffering. And um, with a conviction that the wisdom of awakening is already there, Buddha nature, the nature of Buddha. What is the nature of Buddha? That's his wisdom. It's not his face, not his hand, hair, his uh, family name or heritage, but his wisdom. What makes Buddha, Buddha is his awakening, nothing else. So the nature of Buddha, Buddha nature is his wisdom. So that wisdom is already there. The Siddhartha did not gain it newly. He just managed to purify all that was obscuring the wisdom. You know what is obscuring our wisdom? It's us, by the way. Please do not think of obscurations as something that's like like burdening you. No, 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 you are. We, we are the obscuration, the idea of self, our obsession with ourselves, our our sadness is obscuration. how big a sadness become, the more you think about it, the more you ask questions like, why, why did that happen? Why did he do that? Why, why it on to me? It becomes bigger and bigger and bigger, and Buddha nature is more and more and more hidden. It's like that. Or joy, wow, I'm so happy today. You're just up, up, you know, you're on top of the world. Buddha nature is completely hidden. Obscured or boredom, just for what do I do? When bodhisattvas understand that, <clears throat> then, or yeah, look at beings, they experience uh, some sort of uh, compassion, some bit of desperation. If only we could see this, if 
Only they will see this. That's all that's needed. Nothing has no prostration, no offering. They don't need anything. If only they would see the true nature right this moment. That's it. Work is done. And it is something you carry everywhere. Something you cannot leave behind. Something you cannot escape also. Your Buddha nature is not, a, it's not like it's hidden under a mountain and there are dragons and things to, to, to get through. No, it's just here. This mind that you have. So distracted, the sound, so many colors. Your maybe your bottom is not comfortable on these strange cushions, you know. This this very mind. This very mind. Eh, it's ver the very thing that creates this mind. Is the awakening, this wisdom, the Buddha nature. And that, that brings a renunciation, what we call renunciation. Renunciation. That brings compassion towards others. Renunciation when you look at yourself, compassion when you look at others. But that also brings so much hope. That means it's that close, it's that close so close path has a lot to do with belief also if you believe it's going to be three countless aeons it will be three countless aeons if because you're believing it's so far it's so far but when you are convinced, that's all there is, to be honest, to be convinced without doubt. When you are convinced that it is so close, even if you are 10% convinced right now, I would really suggest cultivating that. Make offering for that, offer, whatever, butter lamb, clean the temple, clean other people's yard, I don't know what you have to do, merit, to accumulate merit. So what? So that you believe it, that, that, that yes, Buddha nature is right here, so close, so that you see it. Everything we do, if we do that, the conviction, it grows, it grows, it becomes stronger and stronger and stronger, as with everything. We really are, you know, we really, the way we practice, the way we are, it's like a coward, how a coward behaves. It's okay to be a coward. It's not your fault. It's not our fault. A coward who sees what's, what's going wrong, a coward who wants to do the right thing, but doesn't have the courage. Fought together, but now is afraid, afraid. But then this coward keeps repeating that one of these days, one of these days, and one of these days, this person, this coward is going to be no longer a coward, going to reach a point when this person is going to say, enough is enough, something has to be done. That's basically how we practice every day. <laughs> Whether it is for immeasurables, may all beings be free from suffering and causes of suffering. What a thing, what a thing to think of. But even if it's just a made up, it's, it's amazing. The mental capacity we humans possess to have such abstract idea that I will help everybody, or may everyone be free of suffering and causes of suffering. Um, so yes, We become bodhisattvas, we become, we enter the path of bodhicitta. Because, um, like I said, not because it is something to do, or not because Buddha said so, but because 
after looking around, we find that uh, to be an awakened being, that's the only way to be fully beneficial to others, to be without uh, any self-preference. So many things we can do right now, right this moment, so many things we can do. Us combined here can, can feed villages in, in places, can, I don't know, bring water where there is no water. We can do so many things, we just won't do it. Just don't do it. Simple fact is because of self-preference. What about me? What about my life? My job? My family? This is all fine, but you, we have this. And this is our condition, this is our situation. But then to also to have that view, may one day I will be like that person, Siddhartha Gautama, who was just there completely day or night. He would just benefit beings without any recognition, without any... So, that's why we want to become a Bodhisattva. That's why we continue on this path. <clears throat> um, Seeing that um, self-grasping, this idea of self that we just seem to have, no one has to be taught that. Um, that um, brings all of our suffering, all of our hopes and doubts and fear all of uh, our afflictions. Kambongaji Thala Shenjuji, Thaki Dijingola Chajiba, Chandrakirti says, first arises the idea of self, and then me and mine, and them and theirs. And then he says, from this one draws a clear boundary, clear distinctions. This is why. Um, sentient beings are also called sosokevo, sosokevo. Soso means by themselves, individual beings, those who differentiate between me and others, sosokevo. Um, so now, reason why we practice bodhicitta, why we take bodhicitta vow, why we do anything is to destroy that, this self-preference. But do not think of it as a, you sort of making yourself homeless and pathetic, you know, like a, not having nothing to eat, nothing to drink, wearing rags. That has really nothing to do with bodhicitta. Bodhicitta is way, way beyond this kind of puritanical or a very... Uh, how to say, self-punishing path. Do you have question? Oh, we should have a break. Yes, sir. You're talking about keeping your own, uh, your own experience, um, starting to stop uh, the effort to try to change someone's opinion, mm. uh, and, and realizing that there's a limitation, your own limitation of uh, knowing 
exactly the thing to say and exactly the time to say it. Sir, um, you, have to, you have to use that, I think. Yeah. Yes. So you were, you were talking about your own experience of um, stopping your efforts to try to change somebody's opinion mm. uh, or direct somebody with your with your uh, your own ideas yeah. ideas mm. um, and basically saying that um, you you don't know exactly the right thing to say exactly at the right time to say it um, is it though possible to um, to in in our um, in our um, in, imperfection towards that goal is it possible still to shake somebody mm. up a little bit towards their own awakening even if you're not saying the right thing at the right mm. moment um, of course you have to observe the person a person is, is really open for a genuine discussion or not and that also depends on you a lot are you having a real discussion or you're there to teach if you're there just to deliver a message no one wants to listen to that except you're like this kind of setup you know when you hear this bong, you think oh meditation time that's how people think now the moment they hear the gong this is different setup but outside <clears throat> reason why I said that I give up doing that is because many times you may shake a little bit but it, it just gives rise, first of all, time consuming you could just be doing something else, you could just be quiet and practice it's way better actually and they might be more convinced if they see that than, <laughs> than arguing, giving it um, as I was saying yesterday, we, I, 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 I studied in, well, I went through the classes. I didn't really study, but for 11 years in the monasteries, three hours of debate every day, I took it for granted that what a joy it is, what a privilege to discuss with someone who follows reasoning, you know, reasoning who takes a, there is a, who takes responsibility for their mistakes. Okay? Because when you debate, there is a system of debate. It's really interesting. And it also makes things very clear. And then outside of that, I'm talking with people who who's just going on in their own bit of reason, a lot of feelings, what I feel, what I think, you know, and it's, I don't know. Now if you, yeah, I guess, please continue to do that. If, who knows, one day maybe you really may manage to uh, yeah, change. But for me, I, I don't have the patience for it, so I give up. So it's like people, people can just I get weird messages. I just don't reply it because what's the point? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Thank you, um, uh, One point this morning, you said that uh, bodhicitta comes out of sheer necessity and there's yeah. nothing else. Could you say a little bit more about that? Yes. Um, yes, that's what I was trying to say. Sorry if I wasn't clear. That uh, you have the wish to bring benefit to all. I believe we all have that. I know at least people in this room you really, truly want to help. Well, now go out in the street and help. 
<laughs> you know, so limited. And so you think about someone like Siddhartha Gautama. Now here, helping, helping is not uh, feeding, it's not clothing. That's a, not real help. What about tomorrow? What about next life? So the kind of help comes from our understanding of what is suffering. An awareness is suffering. Ignorance is suffering. That's the real suffering. Ignorance, not knowing what's going on, what to do, what not. We don't know that. Beings don't know that. An awareness. And so, like I said, for me, um, yeah, I cannot find someone like Siddhartha Gautama. There's nobody like him. And the way he helped is not uh, necessarily by, it does, it's not apparent outside. But then, um, are you familiar with Angulimala? Right? This highway murderer in India at that time, he got uh, de deceived by his teacher. He was a strong man, powerful man. So his teacher wanted to punish him, but didn't dare to hit him or, but he wanted to punish him in a way that, so his teacher said, uh, I have a very secret practice, but for that I need, a, I need you to kill 1000 people and bring proof. So, He was just naive. He believed his teacher 100% and he thought that that must be something very, very specific. So he went and did, did exactly that, almost. He killed 999 people. And as a proof, he would cut their uh, pinky and uh, keep it as a mala. So he had 999 fingers wrapped around his body, some rotting, some completely sort of clean bones. You know. And by that time, he would no longer resemble a human being. He had been living in forest like a wild animal for too long. He needed now one more person. Before that, so many people tried to reason with him. So many soldiers were sent, none returned. One day his mother, she heard now the king himself is going to go into the forest with all of his might. And it was sure that he would be killed. And she was mother, his mother. Mothers are like that, parents, you know. So she thought, I must talk to him, I must try. So against the advice of everyone, she went into the forest and Buddha could see that if he meets his mother is going to kill her, and then liberation is not possible in this life for this man. So just as his, was, his mother, he was about to meet his mother, Buddha walked right in between them. And he thought, excellent, my thousand, you know, so he had a, a sickle. And he followed the Buddha saying, monk, stop. I love that. Um, Buddha was walking just so gently and he was running, it was this giant was running, he couldn't catch up. So Buddha stopped and he came in front of the Buddha with his sort of look that looked like a demon, you know. But then Buddha had no fear, just calm demeanor. So he asked, why didn't you stop when I asked you to stop? Buddha said, Angulimala, I have stopped a long time ago. It's you. You haven't stopped. <laughs> Immediately, his mind went blank. What is... And then Buddha gave teaching right there on the spot. The man 
someone who comes to kill you, who can no longer follow reasoning, become like a wild animal. And Buddha has this capacity, this ability to, to speak, just speak. He didn't do anything else. He just stood there and spoke. And Angulima got to his knees, took off his mala of fingers and said, will you accept me as your student? Is it possible for someone like me? Okay, 999 people I have killed. Is it possible that you will accept someone like me? Of course. And he became an arhat, <laughs> a liberated being in later parts of his life. One day, Buddha and Angulimala, now was a monk, going walking together, and there was a, a woman in labor under a tree. And the, 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 child, the child's position was not proper, and, and it looked like both mother and child might die. Might die. So they ran to, they saw the Buddha coming with his monks and ran to the Buddha and said, please bless, bless my daughter. And Buddha said, oh, no need, he will bless, he is a great practitioner, he will bless your daughter. And Angulimala said, can I bless someone? And Buddha said, yes. Trust in Buddha, Dharma, Sangha, go. And he did, he just did that. And the, the, both the mother and child survived. What? Now that is true power, true influence. No need to do anything, no display, nothing. Just appear, your appearance. The person is convinced that you are sincere. You have nothing but their benefit. And that's because that was so. So that I had nothing but their benefit. That's why now us, I don't know about you, maybe you're awakened, but someone like me, I think, what can I do? And then the more I think of Siddhartha Gautamas and his qualities, the more I'm convinced that that, something like that, I have to become. There's no other way. Let's have a, a break. <laughs> Maybe people have to go to bathroom. <laughs> I do. <laughs> 10 minutes. Thank you.
So <clears throat> then since there is a Bodhisattva vow um, ceremony happening tomorrow, so then I thought um, the the motif or um, mm, the intention of this discussion is then mostly geared towards that. Um, <clears throat> of course, I think all of us have already taken Bodhisattva vows, most, most of us, but it is something to be taken again and again, every day, every moment to be honest, um, more sort of serious Mahayana practitioners would say that there is nothing um, in Mahayana, no Mahayana practice other than the vow. There is no Vajrayana practice other than initiation, empowerment. They are right. <clears throat> Everything becomes a part of the vow, the um, wish to liberate all sentient beings. Of course, then again you think, but I myself I'm full of affliction by myself of so many physical and mental ailments and issues. So how can I, someone like me, how can I help anybody? <clears throat> so then um, to remind ourselves of uh, what we were discussing yesterday, for example, how our perception is not so trustworthy and not to give in 100% to your perception. That's actually the magic of samsara. That's the mechanism of samsara. How samsara works is not created by anybody, any particular being. <clears throat> But samsara happens out of causes and conditions, and its main cause is our belief in whatever that we see, hear, touch, smell, and we can feel. And being convinced that that is all there is, that this is true, this is, the, this is all there is, and this is the truth. And the stronger that belief, longer samsara. This is again the same. Just as I was saying, we we're talking about self-grasping. We believe it. No one asks, why do I? Why must I think in this way? Why do I have it? What is its cause? Who have taught me to be like this? Not, uh, no, we do not ask this. It, even to say this for me right now feels strange, unnatural, like going against the nature of how we are, what we are. So then these awakened beings, they tell us that, um, and it makes sense that just as in this life, 
First of all, they say that uh, nothing happens without any causes and conditions, any reasoning, not, not even a dry leaf moves without a cause or reason. So then here, the reason why we have this inherent belief of self-grasping, they say it's due to habit. It, make, it kind of makes sense. All the other reasons kind of doesn't really make sense. Of all the reasons, I think this makes the most sense when they say it's out of habit. Habit is one of those things that can make us do without being aware of that we are doing it. It makes sense. Habit is something that brings things like back to us, even though we may not be looking for it. Anyway, so in this way, Siddhartha, our teachers, they point to what is for them an obvious fact, and for us is a big possibility, is there's a past life. Definitely there was an existence without this, before this life. You didn't just come out of nothingness. If you would, there should be, I mean, the issues will be endless, to be honest, if you just come out of nothingness. A scholar would have a great time analyzing that. So then, if there was a past life, then it is safe to assume that just as in this life, we all seem to have self-grasping without being taught, inherent, almost inherently, we believe that. So then very much possible. It was exactly like that in past lives too, and it will be exactly like that in the next life. That is one very possible case. And then another possible case is just as we right now, not just as we, everybody, anything, animals seem to do that, although we cannot communicate with them, they function. And it seems they have similar beliefs as we do, trusting, complete trust in their senses. What you see is really there. What you hear has been really said. You know, it's, it's a real thing. And so, and this has not been taught also, or else animals wouldn't know how to react, react to that. This is learned, this is remembered, or habit, or whatever you call it. It is here. It is what we have, complete trust in whatever we see, whatever we hear, even though we know that when you analyze, when you meditate and contemplate, it doesn't make sense, but it doesn't help. So then very possible in past lives too, we did that, and life before that, we did that. Strange how during this uh, journey to the US, it's the same topic again and again coming up. <laughs> but, um, and so we are called uh, Surton. When Buddha has many colorful names for us. Chipa is children. <laughs> children, childlike. Surton is those who only see what's in front of them. Surton. Surton. <laughs> those who only see their side. Surton. So he will say Tsurtong, and he says Tsurtong, it means sentient beings. Not to as a scolding, but as a mere fact that beings, we only, we only believe what we see. And anything that we do not see or know doesn't exist. Nonsense. And so when we were tadpoles in a tiny pond, that's all there was for us. That's the truth. All of this is nonsense. Someone, if one of the tadpoles tell the other tadpoles, you know tad, tadpoles, is it? Right, the, yeah. the, 
recently I saw that in a poem, so I have it in my mind. Sorry, tadpoles <laughs> just floating. Hey, there, there are big places outside the water. Right? All of our reality, what we think is reality, they tell them they are nonsense. What kind of uh, what kind of egg do you come from? I don't know. What kind of <laughs> toad are you going to become? Um, not existent at all for them. So, um, these things are not to uh, impress us. These are revelations of reality, I guess, realities, relative truth. These are relative truth. These are true, but only relatively. This is not to impress us. All of this is geared towards, but one thing is awakening. And so here, for example, this kind of realization, when you get that, and you begin, begin to relax a little bit, I think, you begin to uh, think, that there are various, various realities for each of us. Each one of us are in our own world, our own samsara, and it's very different. Samsara is mind that is with afflictions. That is samsara. Mind without afflictions is nirvana. Samsara is not world. We seem to think that samsara is a world, is a realm, is not. Um, and mind is something individual, only to be experienced by oneself. So no one can experience your mind. You can tell someone how you feel, what you are, hundreds, thousands of times, but they can never really know. It's like that. We are, in that regard, utterly alone by ourselves. You can tell someone, hold them in your arms and tell them, I care for you, I love you, 100,000 times. And it seems like they can also feel it. But within a week, you become strangers. <laughs> and they begin to wonder, if I ever even knew this person, Hasn't that happened to you? It has to me. So, uh, what I'm trying to say is then to have, to not trust, put so much emphasis on uh, what I see, how that make me feel, or should, how do I understand that? Why did that happen to me? Not so much. To some degree, you need to survive. But if you overdo it, you make yourself suffer. You suffocate yourself. You, make, uh, you put a, a plastic bag over your head, and then you make it smaller and smaller and smaller. At some point, the world is nothing but there to serve you and to make you feel things. Then it's not a nice place to be. Everything will irritate you. Anyone can, can make you sad. Anyone, random people on the street can ruin your day or week or month or years even. You might talk about it therapy for years with someone, do they call it flipping? Yeah, like flipping a finger, flipping a bird, whatever. And you wonder why, why, what, do I, what did I do? Was it a, what, something I, the way I looked at it, what did I do? Oh, that is fine if you do not wish to benefit others, if you do not have that uh, idea. I want to benefit, I want to be good, I want to help others. If you do not have that, fine. This is how everybody is. There's nothing different. You're just the same. And it's okay, I guess. But if you want to be a bodhisattva, then we have an issue. A bodhisattva who is 
self, what do you call it? Self, uh, in, in, in ball. Self-absorbed, that just only thinking about <laughs> what I feel, I'm sad, I'm, I'm oh, I'm, that makes me very happy, like all the time like this. Uh, you, you do not have time to think about others even. And then uh, your practice is mere ritual. Uh, I'm not saying it won't bring benefit. It will, for sure. Siddhartha said, anyone who hears the name Buddha is, to gar is guaranteed to become awakened in future. Um, anyone who even sees an image of the Buddha or a Sangha, or even a scripture, or even these letters is guaranteed to become awakened. So, of course, if you just re if you recite for the sake of liberation of all sentient beings, I must attain full awakening, things like that, that will be a result. But, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, it will be a long path. And, um, we talk about renunciation in Dharma. Renunciation, why you're practicing, what is your motivation? Suffering of samsara, right? That's what comes up usually. What is the suffering of samsara? Renunciation, that's how you get renunciation. Based upon your understanding of suffering, the quality of your renunciation will be. If you understand suffering as pain and crying and anguish and sickness and all that, you know, your renunciation will be to be free from that. So it's very small. It doesn't deal with the cause of it. It's just not wanting it. There's no, you cannot really make an effort to remove the cause. Then if your, your renunciation is about self-grasping and how samsara is created, you know, the Four Noble Truths, then, <clears throat> sorry, yeah, understanding of suffering is like that, then your renunciation will be even greater to be awakened, liberated. Now you're looking for something that is irreversible. Wisdom is the only thing that cannot be reversed. Everything else in this world will be lost, can be lost, can be reversed any moment. Um, except the wisdom of emptiness. That brings a kind of change that is, um, let's say, forever. We want things that last forever. That's, the, that's it. That's the only thing that can last forever. Now, a Bodhisattva's renunciation is not even that, not even samsara and how it's suffering. Bodhisattva's renunciation is, of course, you know, they think about suffering of samsara. Now being suffer. And then there is this, Bodhisattva's renunciation is, they're afraid of self-preference. I myself end up harming them. Maybe it's too, if there is someone who is completely new, I apologize. You should really do shamatha and breathe and all that is nice. But for a serious practitioner, Bodhisattva, their fear is self-preference. Because that's the only thing that's stopping a Bodhisattva to be truly useful, truly beneficial, humble, brave, courageous, no fear, inspired, all of that is blocked by one thing, the self-preference. What about me? What do I do? What do I get? So Bodhisattva's renunciation is from that, from Um, <clears throat> um, 
all of this um, requires um, especially when we try to understand Buddha nature, when we try to get that kind of compassion, that kind of bodhicitta, then we need to have some understanding of mind, what is mind, some awareness of it. Mind. Most of the time, we have, and it is based on experience and not being able to decipher that experience and habit and culture and all that. We think there is one phenomena within us called mind that we call mind and we think that is, it's one thing. So, this is how we think anyway, for everything. We think in terms of units, one person, two person, three person, like that. Everything we must calculate. Uh, that's how we understand anything. One tree, two tree, one forest, two forest. We generalize. So it's no surprise that that is the same reasoning, the same method is applied to mind. We think mind, there is something called mind in me, inside my body, that is a, a, like a unit, a one phenomena. And very much so that even to an extent we think when we die, that we leave our body. And that which leaves our body looks like us, you know, like you see in the movies, like exactly like that, like oh, someone is getting out. Have you watched Bollywood movies? In the 90s, especially the ones in the 90s, and someone will die. And then <laughs> some, they're wearing even the same clothes, they sort of get up, <laughs> a bit transparent, you know, like invisible person will get up and sort of walk away. That's what we think mind is. Most of us, that is like a, it's one thing. Um, and here Siddhartha Gautama again says, um, you have two kinds of mind. Sosim, Simjun, Sosim, I guess they translate as mind or main mind, major mind. That is um, kind of mind that only, that, that, that uh, observes phenomena directly without conceptualizing it, like uh, eye consciousness. My eye consciousness sees the cover of this book. It doesn't know its color, it doesn't think of its color, it doesn't think of its size, shapes, cost, nothing. Just, it sees it, that's it. It's, it, it's existence is fulfilled just by that. That is uh, main mind. The minor mind or mental factors, however it is translated, that's supposed to be 52 different kinds. Major mind is like six or seven or eight, depending on which tradition you follow. But uh, the other one, min minor mind or uh, mental factors, 52 kinds. So, all the conceptual now workings, that's all me uh, mental factors. Oh, this is nice. Oh, it's not nice. Oh, this is big, small, red, yellow, blue. So, nobody can deny that. This is something very universal. Anyone, you, you ask anybody, 
you know, sometimes you just notice things, but you don't really notice their characteristics. They say, yes, it's true. Sometimes I just, you know, like right now it's happening. You're seeing so many things, but you're not really registering them. You're not thinking about, like, I don't know, the walls, the windows, the brocades, and all. you just notice them. This is work of major mind, this or mind, this main mind. But when you're then, sometimes you think of things. You look at one thing, you focus, and then you think. So mental factors, it needs additional intention. And so it's shape, characteristics, and all that. Again, reason why Buddha teach this is not to educate, not to make educated Buddhist practitioners who know about all this, who can argue and correct each other. And no, no, this, this, this is this like that, no. But to destroy this belief. Again, same thing. No one has taught us, we just have it. It's one thing, <laughs> we all think, I have one body, one mind. Everybody thinks like that. So Buddha says, there's no reason why. Why must you do that? So he says, look, this mind is not that mind. That kind of mind is not this kind of mind. Clearly, two different things. Then as you go deeper into it, joy is not sadness, jealousy is not rejoicement. Dullness is not clarity. So different, all of this. Very, very different kinds of mind. They're not same. They are contradictory many times. One same phenomena cannot contradict itself. So clearly, you have more than one mind. If you must have a number. Buddha said that uh, if he has to number all the kinds of mind beings have, uh, the, he cannot finish. But just to have some idea, he gathered them into these eight major minds, 52 mental factors or minor minds. And he said, that's, that's the sum total of your mind. That's, that is your mind, what you experience. But then of course, within those minds, you have mind or mental factors such as memory that that binds everything together, that sees similarities and binds them together. Like, a, like if I am told what is a tree, for example. Because let's say I, don't, I do not know what's a tree, what is a tree. I come from a desert, never seen one. Someone teaches me, a tree is like this, either they show it to me, you know, with the trunks and leaves and all that, fruits and flowers. And then the next time I see a similar phenomenon, I think, oh, there must be tree too. There must be, that's how it works. We memory bind things together and create a con concept tree. Similarly, they bind all the experiences together, memory, and then this idea of self, they work together so closely. And you believe that there is one mind. Now, reason why I'm saying this is, we are talking about now bodhicitta and Buddha nature. Buddha nature here, in particular. Buddha nature, as I even the term suggests, the Tibetan word is deshik nyingpo. It's actually not a nature, it's the essence of Buddha. That's Ningpo means essence. Tathagata Garbha. Garbha means essence. So, like, what is it? It's, it's essence. So, we're not talking about the surface emotions. Obviously not. And when, we, when uh, we're talking about Buddha nature, we're talking about the quality of mind, the nature of mind that it cannot lose. It cannot lose, it cannot gain. As Buddha says, whether the Tathagata, whether Buddhas appear or not, the nature 
of phenomena, the nature of all things is always there, is al always remains, have always been there, will be there. And so when we talk about mind and in relation to Buddha nature, we're not talking about this gross mind. Gross mind is not the nature of mind. A nature of mind should always be there when there is a mind. Nature of fire should always be there when there is a fire. That's why it's called its nature. It, it, it should not change. It, sh it should be consistent. It is the tr truth, let's say. It's a kind of a truth. When we talk about nature, we're talking about the truth. Something that keeps changing is not true. Something that... Um, and so, is anger the nature of my mind? Obviously not. I have mind without anger many times. Is desire the nature of mind? Obviously not. What of anger then? What of hatred? What of devotion and wisdom? And also, I do not have desire all the time. So all of these emotions and all of these uh, mind and mental factors are you find there are experiences that is observed on the surface of mind. They appear, they go. And then they appear again, but they leave again. But all through that, the conviction that mind continues remains. And it is true, mind does continue. So then what is it? What is the what is it? What is the mind? What is the true form of it? What is and this this example is very useful, I think, of that of a water. Like this, if you have a glass of clean water, we think it's clean, it's transparent. No, it's clean. That's the water. Then you might add salt into it, two, three spoons of salt. Mm, becomes a bit muddy. And it's salty now. It wasn't salty before, it's salty now. Then you add 20 spoons of sugar into it, becomes sweet now, no longer salty. Not even a hint of salt remains. You keep changing that, then you add colors, white becomes white, red becomes red, then add green, I don't know what red and green becomes, all that, keep doing that. Then, I don't know, sometimes purify it, make it as clear as this, if you can, let's say, in our imagination we can at least. So throughout that, all of this transition of this glass of water, what is its true essence? What is its true nature? Is it when it was clean, well, transparent? It was it when it was red or blue or yellow? Or, or I don't know, full of mud? What is its true nature? And so, there here, then you begin to you have to observe all of these different phases, different transitions, and have fi to find uh, common characteristics. Because they are connected to the nature of the water. They cannot exist without the nature of the water. Same as emotion, they cannot exist without the nature of mind. And so you may come to a conclusion such as, like traditional scholars then will say, the the quality to be moist, to moisten, as Buddha says in uh, the Rice Seedling Sutra, it's interesting one to read, and he says, the moisture, the quality to, ability, potential to moisten other phenomena too, that is the characteristic of water, that is the nature of water. That you can accept then, when it was red, <laughs> Was it moist? Yes. When it was, you know, whatever. It's characteristic to moisten. 
is always there in all, at all times. All the others, they come and go. But its ability to be moist when that is lost is no longer water. It's not water anymore. Same thing with the mind now. Anger, <coughs> desire, ignorance, boredom, I don't know, devotion, compassion, all of these, they are not also disconnected from the truth. They're not, you know, they're not, they're not also something that we just say like, oh, I'm going to find true nature of mind away from this. That's also not possible. If you say, I'm going to find true nature of this water away from this clear water, that's a nonsense. Away from this red water, blue water, it's not possible. If there is a nature, it is there with its impurity. Similarly, with the mind, you cannot find the nature of mind away from anger, away from ignorance, away from uh, what you have. This is, this is what you have. And so Siddhartha suggests, maybe it's the clarity, ability to know why, how you get angry? How come a stone or a piece of paper doesn't get angry, but you do? What is the deal? What's so special about you? Because you can know. You have the ability. You're conscious. You are aware. So there lies one third of nature of mind, sort of. One, the first step of knowing the nature of mind is to know um, sort of what it is, what mind is first, what is mind, and then this, what is it, sort of its true form, what is it? If mind continues, anger does not continue, desire does not continue, ignorance does not continue, it goes up and down sometimes strong, sometimes weak, sometimes there, sometimes not. Then, but then what continues now? Mind, we say, oh, my mind continues, my consciousness continues from past life to this life, from this life to next life. So the only thing left to do is then look for the, the one thing that is common in all. And so that is this ability to be aware. Salva. What differentiates you from a piece of paper, piece of rock. Let's try that. I don't know, sit straight or however you want. But be aware of mind. Let your mind be aware of itself. And if for that you must scratch, then scratch. Keep scratching slow, you know. Yes. <laughs> be aware. If you must, I don't know. Different people, different. <laughs> different things, whatever you need to do, or if you sit straight and let mind look at itself, mind search for itself, or be aware of itself, please. <clears throat>
<clears throat> Thank you. Um, yeah, let's continu continue this discussion, but if you have question, please. <clears throat> Just to... All right, then I think we have a break again. Is it time to run? Yeah. Thank you, Rinpoche. Um, well, I'll have a, simply have a lunch break until I resume at 2.30. Look forward to seeing you then, and we look forward to exploring this further. Have a wonderful lunch. <laughs>